Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first UIMS lecture on rehabilitation medicine, where we aim to really understand the role of rehab in the holistic approach of improving patient outcome. Today, we'll be having our honorary guest, Professor Jeffrey Basford from the Mayo Clinic, who will be giving us an insight about the importance of rehab medicine and its growing importance in the future. Professor Jeffrey Basford has a diverse background in science and medicine that includes teaching physics and mathematics. He previously served as the officer in the US Army following his military service. He worked as a research and development consultant and attended medical school in the University of Miami. Professor Jeffrey completed his residence training in physical medicine and rehab medicine in the University of Miami. And Dr. Basford has been a member of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab at the Mayo Clinic since 1982 where his clinical responsibilities and research interests have emphasized on neurological rehab and musculoskeletal pain. Dr. Basford has a diverse interest in research, primarily focusing on se central nervous system and also the effects of electromagnetic waves on the body. Professor Basford was the past director of the Mayo Clinic Rehab Training Center and is present a corresponding member of the Japanese Association of Rehab Medicine. Currently, he's an editor-in-chief of the Archives of Rehab Research and Clinical Translation. Dr. Basford, we are humbled to have such an esteemed doctor in our event, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Well, thank you very much. Should I share my screen? Definitely. Uh, one minute. Uh... So yeah, let's uh, start. OK. First of all, uh, PMR is probably physical medicine rehabilitation. Uh, we have a number of names which we'll get into. It is a very diverse specialty, far more so than the organ specialty, such as cardiology or neurology. Um, part of this is from a historical background, but it ranges from musculoskeletal to my area of expertise, which is brain injury and strokes to regenerative medicine, pediatrics, and across the whole uh, extreme, uh, whole body. I have a list of uh, areas that we work in. Uh, obviously, we, you all know about the physical agents, uh, which are actually being downplayed over the last 20 or 30 years, and I think will continue to be downplayed uh, relative to exercise and uh, therapy. Uh, lymphedema treatment, that's typically done in, in the, at least in the United States uh, with a, a physical therapy in, uh, with physical medicine and physical therapy in close cooperation. EMGs are in the US are done both by physical medicine and neurology. Uh, we're very strong in that area. Regenerative medicine with injections, uh, stem cell therapies, much of that is done in, in physical medicine and rehab. Uh, obviously orthotics and prosthetics, uh, massages, and um, a, a very strong area where we're probably the strongest is a diagnostic ultrasound, particularly for musculoskeletal applications. Uh, the areas that you'll come across most often uh, will be a stroke and spinal cord injury, a brain injury, a cerebral palsy, a bowel and bladder dysfunction, spasticity control, musculoskeletal pain, uh, and then more in Europe than in the US, cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, there are other areas, but these are probably the biggest areas you'll come across in either a clinic practice or a hospital practice. So uh, I have a question. So do we, so whenever we come across uh, such cases, do we have to obviously, uh, refer to the rehab center uh, in terms of uh, improving patients' outcome at the end of the day? Because uh, I, I'm, I don't know when do we really refer to the rehab center? Oh, very, very good question. I actually uh, have added some slides at the end and we'll discuss okay. that very issue. Okay. So it's interesting. I can see people's pictures on the screen with my, what I think my screen show is, but you can only see the screen where uh, the thumbnails are. Okay, uh, 
to show part of the diversity of the field is that even by its name. Uh, in the US, uh, typically we call ourselves physical medicine rehabilitation. Um, internationally, you'll often see PRM more, more often like an ICEPRM, which is the International Society. It's obviously the same thing, although uh, the terminology is different. Physiatry is a term that's used often for a rehabilitation physician. Uh, it's more in the US, I think, than overseas. Uh, rehab. And for many people, the patients, I'm just considered therapy. Uh, I've got some, a number of little pictures uh, uh, put in here. Uh, some of, some, record, some uh, identifying older therapy practices and some being newer ones. They're, they're more for uh, just, uh, <clears throat> they're not exactly eye candy, but they give you a feeling of how things have progressed. Uh, this right here is a picture of contrast therapy, uh, which was used and is still used a little bit for uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or, or CRIPS-1. Uh, another reason that rehabilitation fluctuates so much is that different countries developed it uh, from their own uh, historical and, uh, perspective. Uh, it, in parts of Europe, uh, you know, spa therapy was far more important and uh, was in place long before what we consider current rehabilitation uh, was in place. And that obviously influenced the countries where spa therapy was very strong. Uh, some countries, gymnastics were, uh, were uh, an exercise were the basis of rehab from the beginning and they have a stronger uh, exercise uh, focus from the very beginning. Uh, the physical agents uh, drove a lot of, well, it's, it is physical medicine, uh, and that drove a lot of the early practice. And although I mentioned that they, their use has fallen away, uh, the, it still influences our practice. Uh, I think the two big drivers that were common across all countries uh, were war injuries from World War I and II uh, and poliomyelitis. Uh, in the 19, particularly in the 1950s or so. Uh, <clears throat> also mentioned, also should be considered the fact that uh, rehab didn't spring uh, new by itself. It was usually uh, started, nurtured in, started in a, a, a larger, more uh, established department. Uh, Neurology and orthopedics were the most common in the US. I believe many rehab departments originated in the UK uh, through the rheumatology route. Uh, in Japan, uh, the rehab physicians are, are orthopedists initially by training. So historically, I believe uh, the rehab phys physicians always used to be orthopedics. Am I right? Well, or they grew out of those departments and then they, they would probably become, uh, orthopedics was, you're, you're quite right, orthopedics was a very common source of rehabilitation, uh, but in some areas, neurology departments were, and those, those, those rehab departments were probably initially oriented toward, more towards stroke patients. Uh, rehab that kind of had its birthplace in rheumatology would be much more oriented, oriented towards arthritis, things like that. But as time has passed, everybody's converged into a, a, the, the common present. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> histories of rehab varies uh, by country. Uh, I am, of course, and most familiar with that of the US. And in general terms, it will, uh, mirror that of the other countries. So I thought I'd, I'd walk through some of the major uh, landmarks. So way back 120 years ago or so, uh, electro, electric agents were very, were very popular both in the US and uh, in Europe, uh, static machines, uh, heat and light, uh, thermal hot baths and stuff were very, were very uh, common. Uh, World War one was marked by lots of injuries uh, and, and 
<clears throat> probably a birthplace of, of much of the rehabilitation orthotics and prosthetics. In our country, uh, we have, uh, was initially practiced in large part by the physical therapists, uh, which uh, with time, Physicians integrated into that, and then they formed their own uh, society. Uh, the first U.S. residency in, in rehabilitation medicine uh, was actually at my institution uh, in, in 1935. Uh, World War II, at least in the United States, led to a huge growth of rehabilitation uh, due to the, um, the need to uh, work with so many amputees and musculoskeletal injuries. So the real focus then was on, was on exercise, began on exercise. Uh, 19, you know, early part of last century, polio was a major, major problem uh, until the vaccines came out and um, rehabilitation post-war war, post post war war two, two rehabilitation really focused on poliomyelitis and the post-polio syndromes. I can remember a little bit of that. Uh, and the rest of it is, you know, ultimately we only became a specialty on the same footing as orthopedics or neurology, uh, basically in 1950. So it's pretty interesting that the, the profession is rel relatively new. It's also relatively small, uh, relative uh, in comparison with the other ones. Um, now, rehabilitation, our focus is really on taking a patient or a person as they are uh, and trying to make their level of function as high as it possibly can be. So a person with hemiplegia, we will try to be able to, to get him to walk, even though we realize he cannot he or she will not be able to walk as they did before. So we're really focused on, if you believe, if you take the ICF, International Classification of Function and Disability into account, we're really most focused on activity and participation. Uh, obviously all the other parts, the environment and the impairment of work into that, but we try to, we're really, we're really working on the patient after a department like neurology would be done with a patient with stroke or orthopedics is done with a patient with an amputation or, medi or internal medicine services done trying to stabilize a person's renal function or cancer. And so we're really, we're trying to take the patient and move them up to the next level of function. Uh, simplistically uh, for a hospitalized patient, our goal is to get them home. Uh, but for a patient who is an outpatient and uh, perhaps we, we can get them back to working or imp at least improve their level of function. So we're really at a little further along, this, we're further downstream than many of the main uh, departments are. So we can add that way. We can add to, you know, in the US patient centrality is a uh, uh, very central, very important now, and be, become recognized more. And we're we're a, we're a, we're extremely patient centered. Uh, another aspect of rehabilitation is that almost all areas uh, practice as a team. Uh, we most people think about physical and occupational therapy. But the team, particularly for inpatients, will include speech therapy, social work, rehabilitation psychology, evoke rehab, and et cetera. Um, for a stroke patient, our rehab unit, uh, PT, OT, speech, social service, are almost always routinely involved. Uh, for outpatient setting, it, uh, for a stroke patient, for example, it might be PT, OT in the rehabilitation physician serving as a coordinator and perhaps modifying some medication regimens. Now, where, where we practice is uh, all over the wall. Um, there are small general practices of two or three rehabilitation doctors. 
These are typically focused on pain, musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, they'll do some EMGs, uh, injections, and uh, more rarely uh, management of, of complex patients. Typically these practices are focused on musculoskeletal and spinal issues. A little larger scale, uh, we have those rehabilitation uh, physicians, particularly those that are have concentrated, uh, have focused on uh, interventional methods such as spinal injections and stuff, will be incorporated into uh, larger practices such as pain, uh, orthopedics, spine, spine surgeons, that way. Um, so when it comes to when it comes to pain, for instance, management of pain, which is uh, quite a, a complex thing to do, uh, how would uh, rehab really play a role? Because, for instance, uh, at the present, uh, doctors uh, prescribe uh, pain drugs, but then when like, how do you really uh, use a physical therapy to really reduce patients' pain? For instance, it can be chronic pain. It could be neurological pain. It could be also musculoskeletal pain, which is potentially could be done by rehab. But how could, for instance, uh, pain be reduced by uh, if it's caused by a neurological disorder using sure. rehab itself? Um, you, you're asking a multifaceted question, obviously. Um, um, Taken a lot of a lot of chronic and, and semi-chronic pain is musculoskeletal, spinal, or, spinal or stuff, a spinal or, or joint. Uh, in in that case, which is a large uh, area of, of pain, uh, you might start, and we'll get into this more detail towards the end. You might start off straight with a physical therapist uh, vis, uh, referral, and the PT would be working on core strength, uh, muscle strength improve balance, uh, non-pharmacological pain measures, type of things like that. If the patient did not improve with that, you know, following your medication use and the therapist efforts, that, that would be an appropriate time for a referral to a rehabilitation physician. Um, the, uh, you know, certainly neuropathic pain uh, in the older days, we did a bunch of things like contrast baths, like we showed, we showed an earlier picture. Obviously, we all use things like uh, uh, gabapentin and that, that sort of approach for neuropathic pain. Uh, we might not have, per se, uh, much more to offer for neuropathic pain than that. However, there's a reason for the neuropathic pain, and we might, we might be very useful for the reason for the neuropathic pain, like the radiculopathy uh, that causes pain also causes uh, impaired gait, weak muscles, et cetera. So sometimes we're, we wouldn't be necessarily the, the ideal pain physician, but we could work with the consequences and if possible, uh, reduce the, uh, the uh, onset of pain. A very good question. Uh, Community-based uh, rehabilitation is often a very uh, generalist. That person might, uh, for example, I did for a while in my career, uh, be based half time in the hospital and run a real and coordinate uh, a rehabilitation unit with uh, PTOTs and speech. Uh, the patients would be those with new strokes, spinal cord injuries, amputations, and the like. Uh, the other half of the day might be spent on con hospital consultations or an outpatient practice for, you know, back, back pain would be a very common referral uh, if it's proved refractory to standard office care. And then uh, there's academic centers such as uh, Mayo, uh, and, and there are certainly others that are bigger than us, and there'd be a large number of physiatrists there. And there they'll, they'll be very specialized. There'll be groups that do only spinal cord injuries. There'll be other group of physicians that do brain, brain and uh, other neurological problems. There'll be interventionalists that uh, do stem cell uh, injections and research, uh, pediatric rehabilitation. So uh, the, the scope of practice is, is very large. Uh, Perhaps like an internist, it can be a very, you can be you can be self sufficient at either very small or very large scale. I'd like to talk a little bit about 
my department, uh, we're, we're loc Mayo is located, the main hospital facility clinic is located in Minnesota, which is in the northern central part of the United States. Uh, these two pictures here are of the hospital that uh, our rehabilitation unit is attached to. The one on the left is uh, about 1899, and the one on the right is a uh, current, current picture. Um, the central part of the hospital is, is uh, the facade is the same as it was back then. Uh, inside obviously has been, uh, been remodeled many times. So our, 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 our facility would be representative of a large, but not the largest uh, uh, academic rehab practice uh, in the United States. We have 35 rehabilitation doctors, as I mentioned, they're ca called physiatrists sometimes. We have 24 uh, residents in training, uh, registrars in the UK, I guess. Uh, we have a couple of rehabilitation psychologists, about 10 speech therapists are associated with us. Uh, we have a research arm that includes uh, about four PhDs with labs. Uh, there is clinical research that goes along with those laboratories that involve the uh, clinical staff as well. Uh, there are more than 250 PT, OTs, uh, uh, vocational therapists, et cetera. And then also, obviously, we have uh, support staff and nurses. Uh, overall, uh, we'll see our department will see more than 50,000 individual patients. I mean, that would be counting one patient one time, even though they came back for multiple visits. Our rehabilitation unit will have roughly 1,000 admissions a year. Uh, the length of stay is uh, for a brain injury or stroke, it might be a couple of weeks, which is shorter than many places. Uh, for a spinal cord injury, it typically is, runs a little longer. And then we'll have you know, half a million therapy sessions per year. These numbers uh, keep growing. And this, these are current as of a couple of years ago. This is a picture of our a rehabilitation unit. As I said, we're attached to St. Mary's and the picture in the lower uh, left is our rehabilitation unit. We're on the fourth and fifth floors here with the kind of gray clad building there. Uh, this is our gym. It's, we've just moved in here about a year and a half ago. So everything is very nice and shiny. And this is a typical uh, rehab hospital room. Uh, you'll notice it's quite large because most of the patients are uh, wheelchair based and actually may need the assistance of two or three people to transfer from a wheelchair to the bed. So in a rehab uh, hospital room, for instance, if a patient is in stay, like inpatient, uh, will they also be closely monitored or like compared to other specialties or it'll just be uh, just because they're unable to move, that's why they are there? Oh, a good, you have very good questions. Uh, so this would be called an acute rehabilitation unit. So these patients just left the, let's say neurology service or orthopedic service or trauma service and came over here. So they, they by, uh, by law have to have enough medical issues to require daily monitoring by a physician. So they'll be past their you know, fracture repairs. They'll be past the stroke workup but they'll still be uh, needing uh, diabetic control, uh, blood pressure control, uh, monitoring for seizures, uh, roughly about 15 or 20% of our patients will go back to the acute hospital during their stay here because they uh, de deteriorate, uh, like have a, have a st their stroke will extend or they get an infection type things. So we're, we're quite acute, but we'd, we'd be considered, uh, most of our patients would be considered on the medical spectrum, a little bit towards the easier side, but they, they could be could well be found on an internal medicine ward. Uh, when they come over to the rehab unit, uh, 
the goal is for them to, for the majority of them, to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy a day, which is doesn't sound like much, but it, it can be quite grueling for somebody who's just recently had a stroke and is hemiplegic. So uh, I would say this is a rehab ICU or just acute uh, intensive rehab care? This would be acute, this would be called a, considered an acute inpatient rehabilitation unit. Uh, we have subacute units, which the need for physician uh, monitoring is, is significantly decreased and uh, nursing will kind of take care of those kind of cares and the physical and occupational therapy will be available, but probably at kind of half the intensity. So um, okay. many places uh, run, when I read the papers and talk to uh, rehab doctors from other countries, uh, in many countries, I think uh, rehab kind of includes what we consider acute and subacute rehab. So the length of stays, if you read a paper from the US, you know, a 10 day length of stay for a stroke is pretty common. Uh, if you read papers, many international papers, you'll see a length of stay of a month or two months. Uh, the difference is that we tend to discharge our patients earlier. If they're not able to return home, they will go to what we call a skilled nursing facility to receive uh, rehabilitation, but at a less intense scale. So uh, the outcomes and the discussion, it's very important to uh, know where the uh, rehabilitation was being done when you try to interpret the results. It's a very different model. Uh, moving on, the outpatient rehabilitation is where, in, for example, in my department, there's 35 consultants, only about five or six of us work in the hospital, the remaining 30 or so uh, work in outpatient practice. Uh, lots of patients, uh, sports medicine is a huge area in the US, a uh, lot of intensity on it, a lot of interest in our residents and uh, consultants in that area. And that would be, uh, typically focused on improving musculoskeletal pain, improving function, and may actually work on improving a patient's uh, ability to pitch or hit a golf ball, fine tuning things. Um, the, uh, the outpatient practice also involves a huge amount of focus on musculoskeletal pain, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, post-operative care, uh, patients that have been discharged from a rotation unit that need continued, uh, let's say, PT, OT, and speech. That'll all be done in outpatient practice. And that's the majority of most, most physiatrists probably pract uh, do practice in an outpatient setting. Uh, hospital based rehabilitation. Uh, as I, we kind of mentioned this a little bit, the typical patients, uh, by far the majority of them are spinal cord injury, uh, brain injury of either stroke or trauma, uh, cancer and surgical. And we, we, these people, as we mentioned before, will get probably treatment from all of our, uh, all of our therapists. Jim, so, don't change, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So uh, one more question I had was uh, previously you also mentioned that uh, about cancer care and its association with rehab, but yeah. uh, what are we trying to really achieve? Uh, for instance, if a patient is undergoing palliative or cancer treatment, uh, palliative care and cancer treatment, how would rehab really uh, help them in achieving pal during in palliative or chronic care as well? Okay. There's a, there's a couple, couple, uh, questions within the question there. So one thing, obviously, like a brain tumor, following re resection, that patient would need to, would be would come to the rehabilitation unit for uh, and be treated rather like a stroke patient in most cases. They actually do better than the typical stroke patient. Uh, so in a patient that is undergoing chemotherapy, uh, but become has become extremely weak, might be admitted to rehabilitation unit to help build them up more rapidly. So they'll be they'll qualify for a second cycle of chemotherapy. Um, 
somebody who's had a sarcoma and has had, has, has had a hemipelvectomy will come on the rehab unit for gait training. Uh, we, uh, we typically are before, come before palliative care, but we often will consult palliative care to help us out. So again, we work on the physical, primarily the physical aspects and the, and the cognitive aspects of cancer treatment. Uh, the patients have to be able to tolerate uh, rehabilitation, either the three hours, or we can occasionally start at uh, 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 one and a half hours per day with the goal of working up. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't work so much directly with, uh, uh, we would work with palliative care on outpatient basis, but not hospice care typically. By the, at that point, uh, uh, comfort is the main issue. So rehab is not very comfortable, I would assume, for patients. So because uh, as you mentioned, uh, in palliative care or hospice, sorry, hospice care, comfort is the uh, main goal over there. Yeah, so, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't typically, you, I, I'm sure there's exceptions, but no, it, it, way we, in the U.S., the way we have hospice care set up, uh, basically it's just supportive care. Uh, mm -hmm. Palliative care, you know, it, oftentimes a palliative physician might see a patient and refer that patient to rehab um, for therapy if, they, if the physician thinks that, you know, this patient could actually function at a higher level than they are and just needs a little bit of education and practice. So it does happen that way. But earlier, you know, following chemotherapy or surgery, uh, when there's a functional deficit, uh, rehab is, is extremely involved, perhaps often from the date of surgery. Uh, there's a lot of equipment that comes and goes, but the center picture there is a gym in the 1950s at, at, here in Mayo. And the picture on the left, on the right there is the current gym. And you know, it looks pretty similar. It looks pretty similar because exercise and function is, is, is the basis there. So you have parallel bars here, parallel bars there. Uh, walker there. A track here for supportive walking, track here for supportive walking. The technology is a little better, but basically the equipment is very similar. So we kind of we kind of hit this already. Uh, areas that people practice, uh, community hospital fit position uh, person might be combination, and much of our treatment is referral based in outpatient setting uh, from the various areas we talked about. I've uh, emphasized that uh, our areas, are, our, our main focus is, is getting people back to the maximum level of function that they're capable of doing. Um, we, work, we work with the pain is, uh, to lessen its effects. Uh, weakness obviously is a very focused area. Uh, compensatory measures for sensory and visual loss. Uh, we provide, you know, we try to improve the patient's function as much as possible. We also provide uh, compensatory measures uh, to help them deal with a lack of a limb. Uh, you may have seen some of these things in, uh, in the therapy gems, particularly occupational therapy, with ways to help people pick things up or put on their stockings. Uh, we use all exercise, exercise, exercise as the primary focus. But we, of course, will uh, use uh, medications and injections, uh, counseling, massage therapy, et cetera, to support our goal. And that's maybe one of the values that a rehab, rehab doctor can build in because they have a bigger knowledge of the armamentarium that can be used. Um, we, there were kind of some questions about what we treat. Uh, I'll just let you read the list here. The outpatient setting is, is heavily musculoskeletal, uh, sports injury, uh, trying to desensitize chronic pain, uh, neuropathy, and cancer, and lipedema. Inpatient is the, the kind of things that you think, uh, stroke, spinal cord injury, brain injury, et cetera. 
Uh, some rehab centers, uh, not ours, for example, will have a, a burn center or work very closely with the burn center. Uh, rehab often has a very strong interest in bowel and bladder function, which is very pertinent for, uh, for patients. It might be as simple as a woman who has urge incontinence or stress incontinence after having multiple children. Uh, many rehab centers will have therapists trained in that area that will work on strengthening her pelvic floor and teaching her some other ways to handle it. Uh, bowel incontinence is a similar thing uh, as we have a lot of experience with uh, uh, spinal cord injury and stroke patients that have similar problems. Uh, pediatric rehabilitation is, is a very big area. Uh, it's typically much smaller than adult practice, but it's very important for the, the children with MS and muscle dystrophy and cerebral palsy. So for instance, if, a, as you mentioned uh, before, a patient with uh, MS, for instance, she might have obviously um, most of the time spastic bladder. So how would, re how would uh, but that's, that's mostly neurogenic. How would, and rehab is focused on uh, uh, more of physical therapy. What exercise or some, uh, what exercises would you do to really treat spastic bladder, for instance? Would you give her an injection or would you oh, yeah. well, give her medication? Well, for example, a rehab facility, you know, here again, the, the line between urology and rehab might be a little blurred, uh, but rehabilitation physician could, could provide some Botox injections. Uh, could provide, you know, oftentimes the a bladder needs retraining, following, like for example, following a stroke, uh, retraining to kind of go a longer period without voiding. Uh, we want to be sure that the bladder empties fully. Uh, and so we have a bladder, we have bladder retraining efforts to keep the post void residuals uh, small enough so that they don't, you don't have, run the risk of infection or in terms of high pressure bladders, uh, hydronephrosis and kidney damage. So um, an MS patient would, could benefit from many aspects of rehabilitation. Their gait might be impaired and they benefit from rehab for the gait. The balance might be impaired. Uh, they can often be, depending on where their brain involvement is, they can be uh, impulsive, uh, lack insight, be hemi hemiparetic just through the lesion. Uh, cognition involvement. So we have uh, physicians and therapists and psychologists might all be helpful for an MS patient. Uh, obviously, cerebral palsy with the speech and language and uh, motor function dysfunction is, um, I would actually refer almost any patient that I, if I was a pediatrician, to a rehab with a patient with cerebral palsy to a rehab physician to provide parallel care, uh, spina bifida, congenital abnormalities. Again, that's, uh, I would almost always uh, prescribe more than the minimal level of physical impairment uh, to a rehab physician. Okay, this is, uh, this is kind of where a lot of your questions are coming from, I think. You know, when would I refer a patient to rehab? Okay, there are a couple things. One is when a patient is clearly functioning below what they or you think they could be working at. Uh, for example, a stroke patient with a bunch of contractures that actually ha has gained some muscle strength over the years, that would be a, a good referral to outpatient rehabilitation. Um, Oftentimes, you know, if you, we talked about this, if you're a general practice or an internist or orthopedist and you have a patient with back pain and they don't respond to non-steroidals or, you know, a week of rest and um, your home exercise handout sheet that you gave them, a uh, referral to PT might be appropriate, would be appropriate. If they don't uh, respond to the physical therapist alone or the physical therapist suggests that they need some help, then it might be a rehabilitation physician. Um, a a uh, rule of thumb is if you don't know much about a condition and rehabilitation takes often deals with that one, that might be a cause for referral. Uh, a very common cause for referral is, you know, if you 
really spent some time on this patient, you could probably do everything that needed to be done. But in your busy practice, you simply don't have that time. Uh, that would be a patient to refer to rehabilitation. For example, an oncologist who sees you know, so many patients a day and is focused on the chemotherapeutic agents, they simply don't have time to even pursue uh, asking the patients about you know, how they're doing at home, uh, are they weak any place? They have any, you know, are you know, are they functioning where they could be level? So a patient, uh, a cancer patient with a significant <coughs> cancer load and symptom burden, they might be a referral to an outpatient, uh, a reasonable referral to an outpatient uh, practice rehab doctor. Uh, lymphedema, beyond uh, any edema beyond the level of where it responds to just support stockings. Uh, that is a slam dunk referral to uh, a specialized clinic, which is often in rehabilitation. Uh, amputations, uh, orthopedists can handle them by themselves, obviously, but often will refer to a multidisciplinary rehab team, which includes a physiatrist to help with fitting, uh, PTs and OTs as necessary. Uh, obviously, some of the new orthotics with electronics require a great deal of training and we have departments who are kind of set up for that. Uh, also, uh, vestibular rehabilitation, it could be located in an audio, in the ENT department, but it often is uh, staffed uh, by or housed in a rehab department. Uh, and the therapists there are, are extraordinarily able with, you know, uh, as simple stuff as uh, benign positional orth, uh, vertigo, uh, as well as kind of the, the gait instability of age, uh, extremely helpful in, uh, in, help, in working with the patients in that area. So uh, a little bit about the background of, re, of training. Uh, in the US model where we uh, go through high school, uh, four year, uh, typically four years of college, uh, four years of medical school. And then on top of that is a four year residency uh, in uh, rehabilitation. The first year is kind of an internship with rotations among the very specialties such as medicine, surgery. Uh, the three years are specific training in rehabilitation. Uh, we have very strict guidelines what that includes. It includes both inpatient and outpatient practice uh, with rotations. Uh, rehab in distinction to many other areas has uh, a very large and growing, continuing grow focus on musculoskeletal ultrasound, EMGs, uh, injections, and not just the joints and uh, joints and uh, paraspinal muscles, but the intraspinal and uh, fluoroscopic guided and ultrasound guided. Uh, spasticity management, I think if you have a patient whose spasticity is troubling them, uh, that would be a very reasonable folk, uh, re referral to rehabilitation. Uh, more and more, uh, the residents are, when they graduate from the residency program, are taking a, uh, advanced training in the subspecialty. Uh, the most common ones are pediatric, uh, spinal cord injury, brain injury, pain, and sports. Uh, so ultimately, uh, you know, a rehab physician is, you, you know, will have, could have, will often has five years or more post uh, medical school training. So uh, why consider uh, rehab as a specialty? Uh, one thing is, especially in, the, in the hospital practice, is you have a long involvement with your patients. Uh, typically a stroke patient, as I mentioned, will be on the unit for 10 days. You get to know them and chat with them and talk about their, uh, their jobs and stuff like that. I, interested in farming and many of, my, many of our patients around here are farmers. So I enjoy talking to them about crops and yields and things like that. Uh, we have a very active team 
when we have a team conference, everybody's comments are on the same level as the physicians, although the physician is the ultimate coordinator. I pay just as much attention to the an OT's comment about the patient's uh, progress as I do to the residents, or perhaps more. Uh, we kind of hit on that there's a whole variety of work settings. You're not just restricted to academic medicine or, or, direct, or, or community medicine. Um, and uh, which might be viewed as a, as a decrement, there's a huge range of diseases and conditions that we treat. Uh, the positive side of that is it allows you to specialize in an area that you're interested in. And uh, for the younger folks, it's particularly the opportunity for procedures and injections is a big allure. And these are some uh, possible sources of interest. Uh, this file is quite big, but I'm happy to try to find a way to send it to you so you can uh, get it or, did, or, or has it all been recorded? Uh, it has been recorded, I, I'm assuming, but definitely uh, you could uh, send me the presentation and I will uh, uh, share it with the participants. If it's huge. Interested. So I, I'll, I'll probably, I can't just email it. I'll, I'll find a way to file transport it or something to you. Okay. 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 Perfect. Um, yeah. I'm open for questions, although I guess I took up quite a bit of time. Uh, I do have a lot of questions. So are uh, anyone else has questions? They can ask uh, Pro Professor Basford right now. Um, okay, so uh, my question is, number one, how do you motivate patients to pursue uh, rehab? Example, I'm a physician, uh, of maybe a future physician. How would I really motivate them to pursue rehab? And how, how you, as uh, the rehab uh, physician, overcomes the psychological stresses patients face? A good, a good question. Um, typically, I work primarily in the hospital setting. The typical patient that I see has been set back a lot. They can't go home, and they want to they wanna be able to go home. So they're often motivated to uh, come to the rehabilitation unit. In the US, if you don't work hard, you can't stay in the rehabilitation unit. So the, the, the laws kind of focus on keeping people motivated. If a person doesn't uh, either can't handle the workload or uh, chooses not to, uh, we have to dismiss them to either a ho home as they are or to a nursing facility. Uh, so typically, uh, motivating the patient is not a real issue. Uh, it can be when they're feeling quite ill and they really can't think beyond uh, their discomfort, their nausea, whatever it is. Uh, the other issue, the other situation is when the patient is confused uh, and, that, and has an abnormal uh, cognition, they might not always see the need for rehabilitation. Uh, in that case, you can enlist the, uh, the family support and hopefully uh, talk them into coming. We don't make a patient come to rehab if they don't want to come, uh, with a single exception, maybe of people who are totally disoriented. So that's the rehab setting, inpatient setting. It's pretty, it's a little easier. In the outpatient setting, if you were, uh, for example, an internal medicine doctor and a patient came in with a bad, painful knee and was limping, I would say, something like, you know, John, you're obviously you're not walking very well. Why, why don't I send you over to rehab to kind of build up your strength and maybe make it uh, and make you uh, less painful there? And the patients usually take that up. If they choose not to, that's okay, but you can always bring it up at the next visit. Um, so it kind of depends, depends on the patient, but it's, it's usually easy to get people to do rehabilitation. It's very difficult to get them to continue to do a home program. And uh, yeah, definitely, it is uh, definitely difficult to uh, do it on your own because you're not supervised. Uh, and uh, number two, uh, also, they do face several psychological stressors. 
the biggest problem I think so uh, the rehab center faces is overcoming the psychological stresses. So uh, what have you done? Uh, I mean, what has, uh, how has practice changed in rehab to really uh, overcome those psychological stresses? For instance, you, as you said, also three hours of rehab is too much for the patient. Okay, well, we, we uh, in the inpatient setting, we, we have uh, two rehabilitation psychologists. Uh, we obviously will use uh, antidepressants and, uh, you know, as, 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 as beneficial. Uh, for somebody who's not hungry, we might use Remeron or antidepressant with an appetite stimulating effect. Uh, so we obviously will use medications like any physician would. Uh, we have a rehab psychologist to help us out. Uh, we have enthusiastic, well-trained therapists that are, are skilled at getting the patients to uh, progress. They build up uh, relationships with the patient, so the patient typically doesn't want to disappoint them in their performance, uh, and vice versa. So I think probably the biggest motivator we have is our continuity of care and the the goal of the therapist to get the patient better and their honesty in wanting to do so. Also, I don't think it hurts to have, uh, you know, healthy young people trying to help you with your stroke. I mean, I think people just kind of thrive with the energy of younger people when they had a stroke in their 80s. So yeah. I think once you're in the system, people can get motivated pretty easy and stay motivated. Mm -hmm. uh, and one last question, how, has, how is research uh, improving in rehab care uh, with technology both and with both uh, laboratory techniques, as you mentioned before uh, about ultrasound as well. But uh, right now I've read many research papers saying that uh, ultrasound could possibly use a put be used as a potential cure for osteoporosis. Cure for osteoporosis. So, how will uh, technology or uh, lab medicine uh, change the future of rehab, or where is research really progressing, uh, according to you? Okay, uh, very good questions. Um, you know, for example, rehab is so diverse. In our department, we have just four laboratories that kind of do pure research. One is aimed towards osteoarthritis and the stem cell therapy. Uh, one is aimed towards uh, spinal cord injury dysfunction and repair. Uh, and a third is aimed at assistive equipment such as wheelchairs and devices and prosthetics. So right there, it's, it's so broad. It's, you know, unlike cardiology where Obviously, when you get into, a, into the heart, you can split, but it's, it's just a huge uh, level of difference things there. Uh, a lot of rehab research is actually eliminated in pruning off of legacy devices. I mentioned that, alt that uh, shortwave diathermy modalities such as that have become uh, less and less used. And that's because uh, research has shown that they don't really affect outcome that much as long as exercise is involved. So some of the exercise, some of the research has been done towards pruning our therapy and more focusing its efforts. Uh, a lot of research, uh, in fact, Dr. Chevelle, who spoke at the last time we were able to be there physically, uh, her research is, is healthcare delivery involving rehabilitation and pain control. And she's trying to work with uh, electronic medical record systems and portals to push out uh, therapy programs to the community. So all people, whether they're uh, rich, poor, rural, or urban can take advantage of it. So that's an area we have research too. So it's very, it's very broad. You kind of have to pick your area to decide, you know, what's research doing in my area. Okay. Uh Perfect. I actually love the answers and I understood a lot about uh, rehab medicine specifically. And it's, it's a very broad field. Uh, can't be really uh, classified as one field itself. Yeah, you used to say it's a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, yeah. <laughs> but maybe it's a, 
three kilometers wide and a meter deep now. It's a little, <laughs> it's, it's a little wider, a little deeper than it used to be. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone else has uh, any questions uh, that could be answered? Um, not, I think so. Uh, no one has uh, questions as for now because you uh, answered most of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that's it, I believe. And uh, it was really wonderful having you, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey. Like, uh, you shared your years of experience with us. Uh, I have, or we have truly learned a lot about how the future of rehab is going to change. And thank you for answering the questions. And I believe uh, strongly that uh, innovation is much needed. And I think so is really the future of rehab at this present, because that's where everything is, everything is turning towards, because innovation is going to meet medicine very soon, as I can predict in the near future. <laughs> and I hope so you can, uh, you might know uh, better uh, than me and everyone else. Yeah, one thing, you know, when if you come out of training and go to practice someplace, you know, sooner or later you're going to run into a rehab physician and you can just ask them what the strengths are at the current of, the, of your institution and, and what kind of patients should be referred to them. And they can give you in, in a three minute conversation uh, a lot of healthy uh, hints about what, what, what is a strength and what is a weakness there and what, who to refer. So it's very site specific. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, be, uh, being there uh, today. And uh, we hope to have more sessions for uh, people interested soon in the future. Or maybe they might uh, obviously uh, go into the track of rehab medicine because uh, many students are also interested in sports medicine. And uh, this was a really great introduction of everything. Yeah, and sports medicine is a huge area, it's growing. Uh, most, of the, I think the majority of our residents are interested in sports medicine or pain medicine. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being there today. And uh, I, will, I will end the meeting right now, but uh, it was really wonderful and informative. Uh, thanks no a problem. lot. I apologize for not being able to, I can see this. I have a great screen show, but it's just not on the right screen, apparently. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Thank I'll you. I'll let you go then now. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a great day.